Good morning to the Commonwealth. This is Young Honey with Raw Dog Radio, bringing you the greatest old-time radio station since the bombs fell. We're going to be hitting you with an arrangement of ragtime on a bridge stories and other old world medias. I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. Now, without further commentary, we're starting off with Frontier Gentlemen, a late 1950s story collection by John Denton. There seem to be only two kinds of people in Montana Territory, the good and the bad. Sometimes it's hard to tell which is which. Frontier Gentlemen. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall. Frontier Gentlemen. Benton on the Missouri River when I reached Helena. There I was lucky enough to receive an offer of transportation in a wagon. So I sold my horse and we set out on the Mullen Road. My companion, or bullwhacker as he called himself, was a leathery, stringy chap who might have been 50 or 70. It was hard to tell. His name was George Scales. And he seemed more than happy to have someone to talk to. Yes, sir. I was running the first shot of the California gold rush. Went out with my father in 49. Now, how old do you figure I am, boy? Well, 58. Uh, 58. Wouldn't think it, would you? Well, well, I... 58. Never had a sick day in my life. Been married three times, buried two. The third got took by Apache down in Arizona territory. <laughs> I pitied the poor son of a gun Indian that's hooked up with her. Boy, she was the meanest piece of calico you ever set eyes on. It was a lucky day for me. You, uh, are you married? No, no. You take no. my advice, boy. Uh, what did you say your name was? Kendall. Kendall. You ain't kin to the Brown County, Texas Kendalls, are you? No. Well, come to think of it, uh, their name wasn't Kendall, it was Frigid. Now, how come you figure I misremembered that? What was we talking about? Well, I, I'm not, not quite sure. Now, now, you take my father. Eighty-six years old, two weeks back. I'm taking him home to bury him. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, or anything for sorrow. All got to go up Salt River sometime. Old buzzer's been out in California better than 30 years. That ain't no place for a man to sack his saddle, so last trip out, I said, Paul, I've got to take you back to Kentucky, because when you back the dust, it ain't fit to do it in this here place. That's what I said. I see. Well, we got us a place in Kentucky. Figure he ought to rest comfortable there. Well, did he die on the way, uh... On the way from California? <laughs> if he did, since you got on back in Helena, oh, the old buzzard ain't dead yet. He's asleep in the wagon. Oh. Eats and sleeps. Ain't much else to do, I guess. <laughs> old buzzard, deep as a post. When he wakes up, you just say hello, smile at him, and he'll think that's just fine, just fine. <laughs> oh, you want a chaw? Uh, no, thank you. You don't talk much, do you? Um, no, I suppose not. What's your measure? I'm a newspaper correspondent. Writer? Yes. Hmm. Newspaper butter, huh? Yes, that's right. Oh. Had me a run-in with one of your kind back in 62, maybe 63. I was a mule skinner with Major McCleave down in the Apache country. You ever been down there? No. Mean, surely mean country. Ain't cutting for nothing. Hey. Hey. <laughs> hey, the old buzzard woke up. Everything fine, Pa. I'm happy. Oh, you ain't never nothing but, Pa. Got a way to go yet, Pa. Hey, this here's Mr. Kendall. He got on in hell enough. How do you do, Mrs. Scales? <laughs> Don't matter what you say, just talk and laugh. Uh, yeah. I uh, understand you're going back to Kentucky. I understand. Uh, what is he saying? There's no telling. You go on back to sleep, you old buzzard. I'll tell you when it's time to eat. <laughs> He's going to do it. Yes, he didn't like you. Oh. Oh, I'll meet a stranger, he'll talk your ear off. Talking to man I ever seen. If he don't take you, he does what I tell him. 
I get an order. He'll keep his mouth shut now. You get off in bed. I'm sorry. Oh, no cause, no cause. Man can't help what he is. So I just hope you ain't like that cheap killing dog of a newspaper fuller I was telling you about. <laughs> I sure did sharpen my hoe on him. <laughs> Well, whatever he did, I assure you, I'll be very careful not to make the same mistake. Newspaper power. <laughs> At midday, we stopped for our meal. Scale, Senior, and Junior kept up an extraordinary conversation, during which time I was completely ignored. The pair reminded me a little of Dickensian characters, a certain gentleman and his aged parent. After his food, the aged parent clambered back into the wagon and presumably went back to sleep as we continued on our way. An offering of tobacco mellowed scale somewhat, and I felt that possibly I might be forgiven for my, my sin by association. It was late that afternoon when we saw the three riders. They were halted by the side of the road. If when you know how to use that gun of yours, Senator, you better be ready to reach. You think they're outlaws? Man's bone seasoned. He don't take chances. Not in these parts. Looks as though one of them is hurt. Well, that's a fact. Well, I'll be a way belly stump sucker. <laughs> a woman. One's a woman. Look at that. If that don't beat all. Whoa! 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 Hey! Hey, you got trouble? Haven't got any medicines, have you? No, got some whiskey. It's my husband. He's hurt kind of bad. It ain't nothing, I tell you, Doris. Just let me rest a while. We'll get on. You ain't gonna make it, Bill. Shut up. Mister, I'll buy your whiskey. That'll fix me. No such thing. It isn't whiskey you need. Either of you gents know about doctrine? No, ma'am. Well, I know a little. Not much. Let him take a look, Bill. Jack, here, come on. Give him a hand, Dad. You know, Kendall, I got a feeling I know that fella. I seen him, but I ain't sure where. Why don't you bring the whiskey out, Mr. Scales? He oh. looks as if he can use it. All right. Here, get your jacket off, Easy, Bill. Easy, woman. i take it. Easy. Oh, man, that sure looks wicked. You better sit down. There's the rock over there. Yeah. Come on. Ah. When did it happen? Three days ago. Did you get the bullet out? No. I'm all right, I tell you. Just let me rest. You're not all right. That's gangrene, the shoulder and arm. There's a doctor in Helena. It won't take you more than three hours to get there. We ain't going to Helena, mister. We're going to Fort Benton. But that's over a hundred miles. You've already got a fever. If I were you, I'd... wait me. Oh, Phil, he's right. Now, please, let's go back. No. I think I could remove the bullet, but... That won't help. You ain't no doctor. Hey, pour some of this panther juice in your gizzard. Cure everything from the rattles to... No. Ain't gonna cure that. Give me the bottle. Take a good big slug, Bill. Hey, don't I know him someplace? Not likely to, mister. I ain't never forgot a face. I swear I seen his. Mind if I ask your name? I'm blotched for your whiskey. We'll be moving on. Oh, Bill, what good is it going to be? You're sick. You can't ride all that way. I do like he said. Dory, you heard what I said. Come on. Oh, Bill. He fainted. We carried him to the wagon, put him inside. The aged parent woke up, smiled pleasantly at the newcomers, and watched with interest as the wife and the one called Jack did what they could to make the wounded man comfortable. I felt a tug at my sleeve. Scales drew me away from the wagon. I know him. I remember. I know who he is. I'll never forget a man's face. Only difference now, he ain't got that mustache he used to wear. The Powder River Kid, Bill Logan, that's who. Uh Oh, ain't you got no savvy? The Powder River Kid. He's wanted in more territories than even James boys. Well, I've seen the posters. There's $2,000 reward for him, dead or alive. Well, what do you say? Make pretty good sharing, huh? Muy dinero, thousand for you, thousand for me. Of course, his wife and his friend might have something to say about that. Then we shoot him. Sure, shoot him now, and then we take the kid on into Benton and collect. I don't think he'll live that long, not without a doctor. Who's talking about alive? Posters say live or dead. 
Come to think of it, we would be better off if we shot him. Might save a sack full of trouble. I seen him draw once, down in Virginia City it was. He fanned two men down so quick he had his gun back in the holster before they hit the girl. Mister? Yes? Come in. Hey, that's the fellas getting out of the wagon, too. We going to kill him? No. He's still unconscious. Mister, you said you could take out the bullet. Maybe it'd do some good. There's too much poison. He's got one chance, and that's to take him back to Helena. Is this your wagon, Mr. Kendall? No, ma'am, it's mine, George Scale. Mr. Scale, I'll pay you $200 if you'll turn around. Take us back to Helena. Well, now, that's a mighty attractive offer. I don't know, Dory. Bill said... I don't care what he said. Right now, he's dying. No, I ain't. Mister, my wife offers you 200 to take me back to Helena. You let me rest a while in your wagon till I'm fit to ride the other way. I'll make it 300. That's fair. Yes, sir, that's a fair deal. <laughs> I'll do that. Make yourself to home. The old buzzard's my paw. If he talks at you too much, just better good and loud. Go to sleep, you old buzzard. You ride in here with me, Dory. Jack, stay on your horse. Sure, Bill. Just take it easy. All right, boys, let's bounce. <laughs> Good idea to camp pretty soon. <laughs> Bet the Powder River kid thinks so. This trail ain't the softest. Hey, how long you figure till he hangs up his axe? I don't know. But I wouldn't worry about it. I ain't worrying. We've been doing some thinking. How come you suppose he don't want to go back to Helena? Somebody's after him, I imagine. That's my guess. If somebody's a U.S. Marshal and that Marshal finds him before the kid dies, you figure maybe we'll have to cut another share on the reward? A fine legal point. Well, I ain't going to worry. Dark coming on. Hey, the lights are looking clearing up the road. Yeah, I got to feed the old buzzard. Hey, 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 hey! After the supper, I walked away from the camp to a rise overlooking the Missouri. There were flashes of lightning in the east, and you could see the outline of heavy black clouds. But there hadn't been any rain yet. I stood for about ten minutes, smoking my pipe. Then I heard steps behind me. Scale said you came up this way. How's your husband? Oh, I think the fever's worse. Will he make it? I'm not a doctor. You don't have to be. You should have gone back to Helena. He couldn't. He was afraid to. Scales knows who he is, doesn't he? You know. Yes. There's been a marshal trailing us for six months. He caught up with Bill and Helena. My brother Jack helped him get away, and we hid out in town for three days. Mm. Well, why didn't you get a doctor? Oh, he wouldn't let us. There's a reward. Bill was afraid a doctor would try and collect just like your friend wants to. <laughs> he is pretty obvious, isn't he? Oh, man's luck runs out. Coyotes started snapping for the leavings. Me and Bill was on our way to Benton before the marshal caught up with him. We figured on going back east. Were you and your brother both working with Logan? No. And Bill hasn't done anything wrong since we was married. Mr. Kendall, I'll tell you a straight thing. I haven't been what a man like you'd call a decent woman. Most of my life, I, I've been a wild one. But not since Bill. I wish I could help, Mrs. Logan. I... I really come to ask you to... I... I saw it done once before with a man's leg that got like Bill's arm. They cut it off. Yes, I have thought of them too late. The poison's in his shoulder. It wouldn't do any good. I'm sorry. A, a preacher out in Utah married us. He'd never heard of the Powder River Kid. He thought we was nice folks. Well, I, I better get back to the camp. 
I went with her. Jack was with Logan in the wagon. Scales' father was sitting on his haunches by the campfire, sucking on a piece of root candy and whittling a sliver of wood. He rocked back and forth, humming to himself. Scales leaned against a tree, ruminating on a piece of tobacco. He beckoned to me. What'd she want? She wanted me to cut off his arm. That's a woman for you. Game to do it? No. Wouldn't do any good. Probably kill him. You sure wouldn't think he was a gunslinger, would you? Not now, you wouldn't. <laughs> Sick and whimpering like a dying pup. You think we could go on tonight? Not on this trail. With the rains coming, no, sir. Besides, the old buzzer don't like traveling in the dark. He don't keep that up all night. None of us will get any shut eye. Anything I can do, Jack? No. He's sick to the head right now. Don't even know Dory. Dory says you know about us. We figured so. I think you're all right, Kendall. My sister does, too. But I want to tell you not to start thinking about that reward. A few minutes later, it began to rain and continued intermittently all through the night. But the dawn was clear and bright. It took the combined efforts of oxen, horses, and men to take the wagon back onto the trail. The wheels had sunk nearly hub-deep in mud. But as the sun rose, we were on our way northward again. Bill Logan was no longer delirious, but in the grayness of his face, I knew that he didn't have long to live. It was during the early afternoon that his wife called out to me. Mr. Kendall? Yes? Will you come back a minute? All right. Maybe he's dead, huh? Maybe. He wants to talk to you. Oh, he's going up with that bull whack. What I got to say is private. Make him stay quiet. Tomorrow we're closer, will you? The old man asleep. Uh, yes. Now listen, I'm finished. I, I ain't a doctor, nothing gonna help me now. I'm feeling. Now, I never asked a favor, no man in my life. I'm asking one now. What is it? There's a reward for me. It ain't much, only 2000 but it means something for Dory. I ain't going to pay no reward for a man that's died natural like. Or if they do like, it's not a go to that Marshall fellow for starting me off. I want you to fix it so Dory can get it. Well, how? You fill me full of lead. Shoot you? Yeah, shoot me. No. I trust you. You see, I, I trust you to give the money to Dory. No, you're out of your head. No, 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 mister. I ain't last night, but not now. It's the best I can do for her. She's a good woman. Now, let me give her something so she don't have to go back to what she was. I can't kill you. You got a right to. Look, I'm wanted, Kendall. I've done more killings than I can remember. It ain't a wrong thing for you to do. You could say I was trying to escape. No, I can't. If not drawn, it doesn't make any difference. We both know you wouldn't shoot. I'm sorry. I don't think he felt very much pain after that. He just drank Scales whiskey and talked quietly to his wife. He died just before the sun went down. Well, I guess he's dead now. I think so. You figure she want to take him into Benton or bury him out here? I don't know. Sure does seem a shame and a sin to see that reward go up in smoke. Perhaps it doesn't have to. How do you mean? How come? I could ride back to Helena. Wouldn't take more than a few hours. What good does that do? Well, I'd take him back with me. Well... All you have to do is to see that they don't try to stop me. Listen, boy, for a thousand dollars, nobody's going to stop you. The old buzzard's still spying up to hold a gun. I just have to tell him who to point it at, is all. 
Hey, uh, how do I know you'd come back? Well, I imagine you'll just have to take my word for it. Ooh. Ain't never trusted a newspaper fuller yet, but I guess there ain't no choice. I give you my word of honor. I'll come back. All right. Oh, courage in there, too. Why, well, ain't going to be nothing to it. All right, Curry, you keep your hands high. Both of you get over to the other side of the wagon. The Potter River kid's going back to hell or not. Scales shouted instructions to his father, who disarmed the dead man and Curry, then held a gun steady, a smile on his old face, head nodding approvingly. I took Logan's body out of the wagon and tied it onto a horse. Just before I rode away, I saw Mrs. Logan watching me, crying, a soundless, terrible cry. I must have traveled ten miles in the night before I found the courage to, to do what I had to do. I led the horses off the road, tethered them, and took down Logan's body. He looked peaceful. Forgive me, Logan. I delivered the body to the marshal in Helena and collected $2,000 reward for the capture and killing of Bill Logan, alias the Powder River Kid. Then I took the horses and rode back to where I'd left the wagon. Did you get it, boy? Did you get the money? I got it. One of these days, I'm going to catch up with you, mister. Get on your horse. You too, Mrs. Logan. Go on. One of these days. <laughs> that was fine, boy. Fine. Now, come on. Let's give you up. Afraid not, Mr. Scales. I've got some bad news for you. You are getting nothing. What? Exactly. Drop your gun or the old buzzard's going to lose his son. Oh. I might have known. Just like the other one. A stinking, no good, low down Goodbye, paper files. It's been a most unpleasant association. <laughs> Mrs. Logan and her brother, a little further along the Mullen Road. I gave her the $2,000, and together we rode on into Fort Benton, Montana Territory. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Joe Kearns, Paula Winslow, Larry Dobkin, Barney Phillips, and Robert Rudier. Music was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Frontier Gentlemen has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. I attended a murder trial in Fort Benton, Montana Territory. To say that it was unusual is putting it mildly. Dear gentlemen. an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. What is a man with a gun? He lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territory. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. changed in 
Fort Benton since I'd left it five weeks earlier, except perhaps for one thing. It was spring now. We could feel it in the streets, smell it in the sun-warm air. I walked up to the little building that housed the Fort Benton Dispatch, a newspaper run by John Warren, whom I had met during my last visit. Outside, a group of men were standing about, peering through the windows. I thought that they looked at me rather strangely when I went inside, and it only took a moment to see why. The newspaper editor, Mr. Warren, sat, pale-faced, looking at a rather fierce individual who stood a few feet away from him, wearing two pistols and cradling a shotgun in his arms. Mr. Kendall. Well, how are you, Mr. Warren? Uh, am I interrupting? No, no. Uh, sit down. This is George McCune, J.B. Kendall. Howdy. Mr. McCune? That's right. What are you, a uh, deputy or something? No. Mr. Kendall's a newspaper man, writes for the London Times. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Well, what do you say, Warren? Well, it's the way I told you. I, I'm not a lawyer. I might do you more harm than good. You're going to be like them others, huh? It's not that, but Clint Wallace is a smart man. He knows the law. That there Wallace is a no good son of a gun. If and he tries any of them smart lawyer tricks on me, I'm going to salivate him right through his fat gizzard. Wallace is prosecuting McCune for the murder of Jack Furlong. Uh, oh, oh, I see. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you something right here now. I didn't shoot that lily liver cut back of a ruptured hog, no how. Not that I ain't saying whoever done oughtn't to get a medal. I'm inclined to believe him, Kendall. The trouble is, there's not a lawyer in town to take his case. Now, I'm willing to face up to what them furlong says I done if I get a fair trial. But I've seen what that outlawyer Wallace can do with his fancy twisting words. You, he got me hung right now. Uh, do you mind my asking, uh, haven't you been arrested? Well, sure, I've been arrested. How come you think I'm still in Benton? Well, I mean, isn't it usual for a suspect to be in jail? Look, there ain't nobody gonna put me in the calaboose, especially for something I ain't done, not know how. Ain't a man in Benton big enough to try it. Why do they suspect you? Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because that eyeballer Buck Furlong, him and that cow critter wife of his, they got it in for me ever since I whooped Buck's brother Jack in a poker game. That's why I cleaned him out. And he swore he'd get even with me. The whole blame family's been going around Benton saying I gouged Jack in the game. Me gouged you? I ain't never cheated in cards all my born days. Well, do they have any proof, I mean, that, that it was you? They ain't got nothing. There's a mule skinner in town, Ike Dawlish. He he says he saw McCune arguing with Jack Furlong a few minutes before the shooting. That fella Dawlish, he heard you one band of sheep too many. You know, that fella's plum loco. Everybody around here knows that. Except they take his word because they got it in for me. Shucks, I was up to the other end of town sleeping off a belly full of pop skull when it happened. Anybody see you? Well, if they did, they ain't coming up to say so. Mm. When did it happen, the shooting? Well, it was about... Two nights back, first I heard of it was the next morning that Marshal O'Connor, he come up to me, he says, McCune, I got to arrest you for the murder of Jack Furlong. Well, sir, I says to him, Marshal, I hear tell you like to talk of Wendy. Don't you try it on me this morning because I got a head on me. It's giving me the orc orcs. Well, sir, he comes back at me and he says, I ain't lying, McCune. You've been identified as a murderer. You'll have to come down to jail with me. And I says, you must be seeing black, O'Connor. If you think I'm going to do any such thing and you try and draw on me, I'll be happy to swap shots with you. <laughs> but I ain't going to pull freight out of here if that's what's worrying you. I'm an innocent man and you're going to have to prove me otherwise. The trouble is, like I keep telling you, McCune, you're the one who's going to have to prove otherwise. They've got the witness. Oh, well, why can't you get a lawyer to defend you, Mr. McCune? Well, sure, now I'll tell you why. Because that there Buck Furlong's wife, Maggie, is Barry's daughter, that's why. And Dad Barry's the justice of the peace, and they ain't no lawyer with stuffings enough to stand up again at old whistling britches. Ah, uh, that does make it rather open. You know something? It ain't right nor fitting in these times that a man can be telling the truth and no one believe him. Now, look, Warren, you ain't afraid of that Dad Barry, are you? You know I'm not. Well, then I'll pay you a hundred and silver if you talk for me. I'd like to, McCune, but... All right. All right. You don't have to say no more. I'm walking me up to the trial house, and I'm going in and let them say what they want, and then I'm walking out, and the first man tries to stop me is going to get lead poison. Well, what do you want, O'Connor? Uh, George McCune is marshal of this here town, and authority vested in O'Connor, come on, talk horse. What you want? 
I got to take you down for the trial, McCune. I'm asking you polite like to give up your gun. I'm going to go with you, O'Connor, because you got a duty. But if you think I'm giving up my sixers of this here goose gun, you don't know no more than a mule or rabbit. Now, let's rattle hawks out of here. <sighs> you know, I feel sorry for him, but I'm glad to see him out of here. He's been with me for better than two hours, Kendall. Yes, I can see where he could be quite persuasive. You know, I wasn't kidding. If I'd have thought I could help him, I would. But I'm no good at public speaking and never was. Break out all of a sweat. He'll do better alone. Who is he? Oh, McCune, he used to be an Indian scout with Crook. Hadn't been able to forget his ways. He's a tough man and likes folks to know it. That's why even if he didn't kill Furlong, most everybody figures he did, the jury will too. You don't think so? No. No, he wouldn't have stayed around for the trial if he had. Besides, he wouldn't have killed a man like Jack Furlong. He'd have got more fun out of stomping his head in. I knew Furlong, his scroungy little toad, always fooling around with women. Somebody else's if he could. What'll happen if the jury finds McCune guilty? I don't know. It'll be trouble, though. Uh, it seems a bit unfair, doesn't it? Well, sure it is. But what are you going to do? You know, as an outsider, I might be able to defend McCune. Do you know anything about the law? Well, I know some pretty important words. That might help. And I have a feeling that McCune's telling the truth. I don't know about old Dad Barry, though. If he doesn't admit you to court, there's nothing you can do. I think he will. Let's go and talk to McCune. <laughs> saloon it was already half full. The accused man was sitting in a small storeroom drinking a glass of beer, his, his gun still very much in evidence. Marshal O'Connor stood in the entranceway trying to appear as though he were guarding his prisoner, although he seemed extremely nervous and was obviously unhappy with his job. He didn't want us to talk to McHugh. I'm sorry, Mr. Warren. I can't let either of you gentlemen in to see him. We're his legal counsel, O'Connor. O'Connor, you let him pass by or I'm going to come out. You said you ain't got no lawyer, McHugh. He's got one now. Don't give me no trouble, O'Connor. I ain't in the mood. All right, close the door, O'Connor. Well, I see you changed your mind, Warren. I'm real grateful to you. It's not me, McCune. It's Mr. Kendall. He's going to talk for you. How come? I heard what you had to say. I think there's a good chance you're innocent. Are you a lawyer? No, no, but I know something about law. Probably as much as Mr. Warren. Uh-huh. Uh, how much you figure on getting paid? Well, if we win, what you would have paid Warren. If we lose, no. It won't matter. Yeah. All right. All right, you got yourself a deal. But I want to tell you something, Kendall. If they call me guilty, you better duck, because it's going to be the ding-dangest shoot-up you ever saw in Benton. the saloon courtroom was full. The judicial bench was the counter, and whiskey barrels set up on end in front of it served as the legal bar. Twelve good men and true sat at tables placed to the side in a row. They were highly conscious of their importance to the community, and only four were taking advantage of the convenience of whiskey close at hand. Windows and doors stood open for the comfort of those inside who might feel the spring warmth and for the accommodation of those crowded outside, unable to obtain even standing room. At one o'clock, court was called to order, the clerk hammering on the bar with the butt of his head. We got a case coming up in this here courtroom. On account of George McCune, Bushwhack Jack Furlong, and he's going to get tried for it. Oh, now, everybody get up in the cloud knockers, because here's his honor, Dad Bear, who was the judge of this year, was All right, everybody's set. <laughs> Court's in session, and I aim to state this ain't going to be no box social, so don't nobody forget it. Clint Wallace. Uh, right here, Your Honor. You ready to prosecute? I'm ready, Your Honor. How about the defense? <clears throat> 
The defense is ready. Who are you? J.B. Kendall. I've been retained as barrister to plead the case for my client, George McCune. You one of them traveling lawyers? Uh, no, sir. You got papers allowing you to talk in the territory of Montana? Uh, no, sir. Then sit down. Well, I submit, Your Honor, that Mr. McCune has a right to be heard and is within those rights to call whomsoever he chooses to speak for him. He has chosen me. A, uh, a, a prima facie rule of law. <clears throat> Phipps versus Mahoney, Nougat, um, 1803. What's he talking about, Clausen? Well, it sounds like law talk to me, Your Honor. Uh, give me that legal book. Uh, let's see. Well, I ain't going to hold up this trial whittle-wanging with you, mister. It's so facto. So don't go trying any jackleg stuff with me or by ziggity. I'll find you for contempt of this here judicial court. You savvy? Bring in the prisoner. I'll bring in George McHugh. Ain't nobody bringing me in. I'll bring him own self. My two. This hombre's on trial for murder. What's he doing with them shooting irons and the shotgun? McCune, you better give me them guns. I ain't giving you nothing. <laughs> Marshal, you is Marshal. You hear what I say? Take them weapons off and give. Hey, Your Honor. Now, I got a big respect for things legal. That's how come I'm here. But if anybody tries to take my sixes, there's going to be a mess of trouble. These here weapons is to protect myself. Marshal, I'm telling you. Hey, Dad, you want them guns, you go get them yourself. <laughs> What are you objecting about, Clint? Ain't your court? I'll get on with the trial. Our gentlemen and the jury, we're going to prove that George McCune did with malice and plain ornery cousins. Killed poor old Jack Furlong on Thursday last at 9.30 o'clock. The way she's carrying on, you'd think she was married to Jack instead of Buck. We will prove that the killer McCune did take... Objection. What's the objection, mister? The learned counsel refers to my client as a killer. This has yet to be proved in trial. Ain't no call to object. Go ahead, Clint. <coughs> the killer, McCune, did take a forty-five and blew two holes in said deceased Jack Furlong. It killed him. We got witnesses to say how it happened. <coughs> That's all, Your Honor. All right. Hey, you. What's your name? Kendall. Yeah. Well, go on and make your speech. So thank you, Your Honor. Uh, gentlemen of the jury... I shall not take up your time with a verbose statement. I will only say that when the trial is at an end, you, the peers of George McCune, will send him from this courtroom a free man, exonerated of any complicity in this crime. Well, what does he mean by that? Clint, call the first witness. I call Buck Furlong, the dead man's poor brother, to the stand. <laughs> Uh, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, so I help you? Sure. Well, tell what your name is, Buck. Shucks, you know my name, Lawson. Now, Buck, this here's a court of law. We got to do things right. State your name. Buck Furlong. Oh, uh, Mr. Furlong, I'd be obliged if you'd tell the court just what happened on Thursday night. Sure, Clint. Like everybody knows, that no count McCune shot my brother Jack. <laughs> I, I object. You shut up, mister. It ain't your turn yet. Go ahead, Buck. Jack said he was coming down here to your place, Dad, for a shot of whiskey. And that sidewinder McCune dried off. Mister, you free me of your head. Come on, come on, come on. McCune, I'm fining you $20 for pulling the gun in this here court. Ah. That is contempt. No more questions, Your Honor. Cross-examination. Go on. <coughs> Mr. Furlong, you... You say that McCune killed your brother? He sure did. How do you know that? Everybody knows I it. didn't ask that. How do you know? Because he's the only one could have done. Ike Dawlish seen him do it. And Mr. Dawlish told you. Well, sure. Ain't that right, Dad? That's right, Buck. <coughs> told me, too. You had no other proof? I didn't need none. That's all, Mr. Furlong. Thank you. Next witness. Mm -hmm. 
There were ten more witnesses after that, all proclaiming Jack Furlong's good name and damning the cunes. The trial was momentarily interrupted when two deer were spotted frolicking in a meadow a hundred yards from the courtroom. There was a wild dash to the windows in order to obtain a better view. When order was restored, one of the prosecution's most important witnesses was called, Mrs. Buck Furlong. <laughs> oh, Maggie, there ain't a soul here don't understand how you felt about your brother-in-law. It's the truth. You tell the court what you know about the murder. Well, well, that highbinder McCune, it wasn't enough. He cheated our poor Jack out of his money, which everyone in Benton knows. He hated him because his conscience wouldn't let him sleep. Haunted him like. So what I figure is when poor Jack went down to get himself a drop of whiskey for his poor tooth, which was ailing him something terrible, he run into McCune and him being a drunken skunk. The tune couldn't stand a face up to him, so he shot him up. <laughs> That's how it happened, Paul, Your Honor. You just asked Ike Dollish. He'll tell you. Poor John. No more questions, Your Honor. <laughs> Mrs. Furlong. And you, uh, Mr. You ought to be ashamed defending a sucking child like that. Ain't hey, nobody! Man, no one told me! of your brother-in-law, were you not? A sweet honey boy, he was. Yes, I am sure this must be very painful. But aside from what you are told, you have absolutely no proof that George McCune shot Jack Furlong. Oh, look at him! Look at him! Sitting there, still carrying the very gun that he murdered with! Oh, 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 oh,
mind, my friend. I don't think you saw Mr. McCune at all. I think you either saw someone else, or perhaps you shot Jack Furlong yourself and blamed it on McCune. I'm getting out of here. How did you know, Kendall? <laughs> I didn't. Not until Dawlish made that slip about color. The rest was luck. You know, I feel kind of sorry for little Run, even if he did blame it on me. Has he said why he did it? Oh, well, it seems Jack Furlong was rather romantically inclined toward Dawlish's wife. He knew Mr. McEwen would be the easiest person to blame for the shooting. And, well, that was that. Hey, and not that it makes no never mind, but... Listen to that Maggie Furlong. You figure maybe she and Jack was uh, romantically inclined? Hmm? I figure that Jack Furlong had a very bad case of spring fever. It killed him. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jack Crucian, Harry Bartell, Joe Kearns, Will Wright, Jack Moyles, Jeanette Nolan, Vic Perrin, and Stacey Harris. Music was composed and conducted by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to be with us again next week at this time... For another chapter from the journal of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. In a card game, aces and eights are known throughout the West as a dead man's hand. There's a good reason for it. And this is the story of how the hand got its name. <laughs> Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun... He lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. In just one minute, we'll bring you this latest report from the Frontier Gentlemen. This is James Matthews with official results on the automobile competition the whole industry watches every year, the famous mobile gas economy run. This year's run, 1,883 miles from Los Angeles to Galveston, Texas, ranging from sea level through mountain passes. And once again, Chrysler Corporation cars took the lion's share of firsts. Plymouth, Chrysler, and Imperial again this year for the second straight year, winning first place over all other cars in their class in the famous economy run. Imperial, by the way, was sweepstakes winner too, getting 62.7188 ton miles per gallon. The forward look is a lot more than look. You get a better engine, brownier brakes, torsion air ride at no extra cost. And winning performance and economy in cars of the forward look from Chrysler Corporation. Take a drive this week in a car of the forward look. Plymouth, Dodge, DeSoto, Chrysler, or the triumphant Imperial. Drive one of America's performance winners from Chrysler Corporation. Now starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. I left Fort Benton, Montana Territory, in a little river steamer called the Pride of the West. The journey downstream on the Missouri was a good deal faster than that which I had made coming up from St. Louis just a few months earlier. I decided to write some articles for the London Times on river travel in the American West. But the balmy weather, coupled with a feeling of complete indolence, made me put off all thought of work. Several days passed, and then we docked at Fort Pierre in Dakota Territory. 
I went ashore to purchase a new pair of boots. And it was in the store of an outfitter named Judd Scott that I first heard the name of Deadwood. Well, the left one might be a bit tight. Yes, right here in the heel. Oh, she'll ease up, mister. Of course, I don't do much trade in ready-mades. If you had more time, I'd make you a real fine pair. Finest in Dakota territory. Here, let me take it off. Uh, uh, try to work it out. Uh. So you're a newspaper correspondent, huh? Well, we've had them come through, but none from England. Must be pretty interesting, your line of work. Yes, it is, quite. Yeah, too bad you ain't staying around these parts. Your folks back home would get a pleasure out of reading about things we got around here. You mean in Fort Pierre? Well, there ain't too much going on here. I guess you could write about Jack McCall, though. Uh, try it on oh, now. It All should right. be better. Now, <clears throat> Jack McCall, huh? He used to drive a stage between here and Deadwood. Got some tall yarns to spin about Indians and the like. Hey, go ahead. Take a walk now. Yes, I'd like to meet him. He's uh, back in Deadwood now. Is that, that better? Yes, fine. Where is Deadwood? You mean you ain't heard of it? Oh, worst bunch of cutthroats and outlaws living in all the territories and the United States is in Deadwood. They even got Wild Bill Hickok out there. I hear tell there's folks wanting to put him up for Marshal. Hickok? Yes, I've heard of him. Yeah, it won't take Wild Bill long to clean up, I can tell you. Mm. Deadwood, huh? Oh, uh, you taking the boots? I'm taking them. I sold the remainder of my ticket to a man booking passage for St. Louis. And the next day took the stage from Fort Pierre to Deadwood in the Black Hills of Dakota Territory. At the stagecoach station in Deadwood, I inquired after Jack McCall and was directed to Carl Mann's saloon. Even though it was Sunday, I was surprised to see that the place was practically empty. A hatchet-faced woman dressed in black was drinking alone at the bar, and I found McCall, a broken-nosed, sullen-looking man, sitting at a table playing a game of solitaire. Yeah, that's me. Who's asking to know? J.B. Kendall. What's your business, J.B. Kendall? Well, a gentleman in Fort Pierre mentioned your name. He runs the general store. Judd Scott? Uh, yes, that's right. How come you want to talk with me? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm a newspaper correspondent, and I thought there might be a story to write about Deadwood, and your friend suggested that I get in touch with you. What kind of story are you thinking about? I understand that Wild Bill Hickok is in town. Do you know him? Mm -hmm. Why don't you ask her? Hmm? Or at the bar. Calamity Jane. Figures she knows him better than most. Oh, well, thank you, I will. Uh, perhaps I can buy you a drink after? Yeah, suit yourself. I ain't going nowhere. Um, <clears throat> Miss, uh, Miss Jane? You talking to me? My name's Calamity, ain't no miss in it. Calamity Jane. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm J.B. Kendall. The gentleman over there mentioned that you were a good friend of Wild Bill Hickok. Who? Why, that ain't no gentleman. That's a stinking pig by the name of Jack McCall. You've been sitting with him. Don't foul up the air around me. Hit the trail, mister. Yeah, well, um, I was hoping you could introduce me to Mr. Hickok. Hey, you English? Yes. Thought so. Knew an English fella down in Abilene. Wouldn't quit riding herd on me. Had to shoot him. <clears throat> oh. New in town, ain't you? Just arrived. You ain't friend of McCall? Oh, I only met him a few minutes ago. What brings you? Well, I am a writer, newspaper articles for the London Times. Hey, I guess you heard about me and Wild Bill, huh? Oh, yes. Fastest man with a gun you'll ever see. I ain't too bad myself, but I ain't nothing to Wild Bill. Come on over to the table, bring the bottle, and I'll tell you about me and Wild Bill. <laughs> Calamity Jane was a strange, almost 
masculine looking woman, hard and rough voiced. She told me of her exploits as a scout with General Crook's army in the war against the Sioux, but most of the time she spoke of Hickok. About a half an hour had passed when I noticed Jack McCall get up from his table and come toward us. Yes, sir, what Wild Bill done in Abilene, there ain't another man could have handled. Why, he... Now, mister, I thought you was going to buy me a drink. Oh, uh, not, not just now, Mr. McCall. I'm talking to the lady. Oh, yeah, I see. It's mostly listening. Ain't nobody gets to talk much around her. McCall, you want me to put your eyeballs out with this bottle. You open that barn door of yours just once more. Kendall, you come on down to Boot Hill Saloon when you're through. I'll tell you the truth about that female polecat there in a windy train. <laughs> One of these days, me or Wild Bill's gonna pump that coyote full of lead. Except he ain't worth wasting a ball on. And all I know about him is that he used to drive the stage between here and Fort Pierre. Yeah, lost that job because he couldn't hold his liquor. Used to be a buffalo hunter till the feller he worked for caught him stealing hides. He ain't no good, that one, and his pals is worse. You ever run into Tim Brady or Johnny Varnes, you watch your step, mister. Them's two of the boys, along with McCall, Wild Bill's gonna run out of this town when he gets to be marshal. Where is Wild Bill now? He's up in the hills working on his claim. Him and his partner, Colorado Charlie. They ought to be back by tomorrow. He'd like to meet you, mister. Wild Bill always had a liking for you newspaper players. Well, what's your hurry? Sit down, we'll split another bottle. Oh, thank you, but now I think I'd better get settled. Wash some of this Dakota dust off. <laughs> <laughs> what a dude. <laughs> All right, go on up the hotel. Tell them Calamity Jane sent you, and if they don't give you the best room, I'll shoot up the place. <laughs> The recommendation was most effective. I got the best room in the hotel. Two hours later, in spite of Calamity Jane's warning, I wandered down to the Boot Hill Saloon. I was curious about McCall and what he might have to say about Calamity and Wild Bill Hickok. I found him there, very drunk. He was talking to a heavy set man who was chewing on an unlit cigar. McCall greeted me as an old friend. Hey, hey what do you say, Colonel? You had enough of that female win by then. Hey, Tim. Tim, this is the fellow I was telling you about. Uh, uh, Kendall's his name. Yeah. Uh, Kendall. Hi. How are you? Tim Brady. I owe Mr. McCall a drink. I came down to settle my debt. Oh, that's real fine of you, Kendall. Oh, Tim Kendall's coming to Deadwood to write a story about Wild Bill Hickok, the new marshal of Deadwood. <laughs> you go get yourself, get yourself a drink, McCall. Sure, Tim. <laughs> Take a chair, Kendall. New marshal of Deadwood. <laughs> I, uh, I wouldn't pay no heed to what McCall says. Not when he gets too much whiskey in him. Did he say something? About Hickok being marshal. Oh. Uh, Oh, well, it's not particularly the news. I heard that in Fort Pierre five days ago. Well, don't you believe it? Oh? Fellers around here, they don't want his kind. <laughs> you go writing in your paper a thing like that, you're going to have to turn right around and write that it ain't true. He's not going to get the job? No. I tell you, he does a lot of ear greasing, like that crowbait mare, Calamity Jane. But all them things you hear is just a lot of brag. Hickok never plugged a man less than the feller's back was turned. I was down to Abilene when he dragged Gulch Bill Cole. This is the worst thing you ever seen. Shot him in the back. Then by mistake, he goes and kills his own pal, Mike Williams. <laughs> no, sir. Deadwood ain't gonna put up a man like that for Marshall. You think so? Oh, I don't know. I, I suppose it depends on how many want him. Oh, well, there's a lot of them miners up the hill. They're the ones. Figure he's a real big man. Heard all them crazy stories about him. You want to know what I think? I'd be very interested. I don't think he'd last two minutes as marshal before somebody shot the daylights out of him. Yes, your best thing for Hickok to do is get out of that. Wouldn't stay out. You see him, you tell him that.
The next night, Calamity Jane introduced me to Wild Bill Hickok. He looked older, more tired than I'd imagined him. As we sat in his room, I noticed that he blinked his eyes, rubbed them, and seemed quite nervous. Constantly glanced toward the door. Calamity had gone out to buy some food. Me and Colorado Charlie had a rough week up on the hills. Feels kind of good to get back. Uh, you ever done any mining, Kendall? No, no. Well, if you ever had the idea, get somebody else to do the work for you. Well, what do you think of Deadwood? Oh, I haven't been here very long. <laughs> Ain't much like London, I bet. No, no, it isn't. Well, do a little cleaning up like I did in Hay City and Abilene. We'll have a right nice little town. When do you expect to begin as marshal? And any day now, the boys are getting things moving. I saw a man yesterday, Tim Brady. Brady? And he asked me to give you a message. Huh? The best thing for Hickok to do is to get out of Deadwood and stay out. Well, that's what he said, huh? Yes. You know why? They're afraid of me. They know what's going to happen after I get sworn in. I run them out, and if they don't run, we have a showdown. Brady and his pal Varnes ain't got stomach for that. I gather they're the somewhat unsavory element in Deadwood, is that so? <laughs> Mister, you ain't just milking pigeons. Why, them miners up in the hills would be dead ducks for Brady and his gang if it weren't for me. This is the worst mining camp in the territory. Ain't been no law here since it started, and Brady don't want none. That's how come the miners want me for marshal, protection. Well, I'm surprised he hasn't tried to get rid of you before this. Yeah, that Jay Hawker knows what had happened to him in a shoot-up. He'd like to try nothing. A fellow like that gets somebody else to do his dirty work. Oh, it's only me, Bill. Put away the gun. I told you, Charlie, you ought to knock. Uh, I keep forgetting. This is J.B. Kendall. He's going to write a story about me for an English paper. Yeah, I run into Calamity down to Carl's place, and she told me. Nice to meet you, Kendall. And you, sir. My old pal, Charlie Utter. Colorado Charlie's good enough. Kendall's been talking to Brady. Oh, that's so? Rest your saddle, Bill. You make me tired standing. Brady said I ought to get out of town. Oh, he'd like that fine. Yeah, he'd like that. Well, I guess I'll go and wash up before Calamity gets back. You staying around, Charlie? Yeah, I thought maybe we'd go down to Carl's later and play some cards. All right. I'll be right back. Sure. Uh, got a lot on his mind, has Wild Bill. He ain't usually like this. He seems to have trouble with his eyes. Oh, you noticed, huh? I wouldn't want you to say nothing in front of Bill, but... He's been scared he's going blind. Yeah, things sure don't seem like the old days. Oh, I gotta get these boots off. My feet's killing me. How old is he? Wild Bill? Yeah, let me see. Uh, 39. Of course, to hear him talk, you think he's closer to 60. I sure do fret over him sometimes. Always talking about dying, this and that. Ain't hey, like the old days. He sure was a rip snorter. Oh, well, maybe when he gets to be Marshal again, everything will be like it always was. Calamity Jane came in with the food, and behind her, Bill Hickok. It was a strange supper. Both Colorado Charlie and Calamity kept up a stream of conversation. Anecdotes singing the praise of Hickok's past accomplishments, but the the atmosphere was strained. The man with the long hair didn't say very much. Afterwards, Charlie Utter invited me to accompany them to the saloon. I noticed that Hickok was reluctant. Possibly he had a feeling, a warning of what was to come. It was eight o'clock when we arrived at Carl Mann's saloon and sat down at the card table. <laughs> Charlie, change seats with me. I ain't sitting with my back to the door. Wild Bill, you're getting worse than an old woman. Well, maybe so, but that's the way it is. I like to see what's coming in. Well, here. Yeah. yeah, take my place if you like. Yeah, no, sir. All he wants is a catbird seat. That's how come he's always winning. Now you ain't moving, Bill. <laughs> you got the right idea, Charlie. Wild Bill, you got your seat, and that's the way it's gonna be. Carl! 
Bring us a bottle of whiskey and a deck of cards. Marshal Hickok's gonna be the big loser tonight. After a few minutes, we were joined by a miner, and the five of us played. It was a friendly game, and we could see Hickok beginning to relax. He was a good player, and held more than his share of winning hands. But while the game went on, there was something happening down the street in the Boot Hill Saloon. We didn't know it then, but after it was too late, we heard what had taken place. Three men sat in a back room, one of them drinking heavily. This was Jack McCall. The other two were Tim Brady and Johnny Varnes, the leaders of the Tufts in Deadwood. Well, I'm telling you, Jack, you'll be a big man. Why, they'll look at you when you walk down the street. He'll say, there goes Jack McCall. He killed Wild Bill Hickok. Now, you hear what Johnny says? Yeah, I hear. Uh, give me another drink, Jack. Well, sure. He's in Carl's place right now. You could get him easy. Oh, might not be so easy. Well, you ain't afraid, are you, Jack? No, I ain't afraid. No. No. no I ain't afraid, but it just, it just won't be so easy. Of course, we could get somebody else to do it. We just figured, Tim and me, we figured you was a man well, for the look, job. I ain't saying I won't do it. You know what it. we could I... do, Johnny. What? We could maybe get that newspaper fella, you know, Kendall, to write something about Jack in his paper. Hmm? How'd you like to see that, boy, in the English paper? Jack McCall shoots down Wild Bill Hickok. Yeah, you could go on the stage all over with that. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> he's right down the street, Jack. Yeah, I seen sure. him myself. You know what? He's sitting with his back to the door. I, I, you listen. Just listen, how come if you was there, you didn't plug him yourself? Yeah, it ain't no use, Johnny. He don't understand. All right. No, 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 wait a minute. I'm, I'm not just, uh, I'm just asking, that's all. Now, just tell me how come. Because Calamity Jean and Colorado Charlie is with him. If they saw me, they'd know something was wrong. But not you, Jack. They wouldn't figure you drawing on Hickok. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. That's all I wanted to know is why. All right. What do you say, Jack? Sure, why not? <laughs> sure. Give him a gun, Johnny. And don't you miss, boy, you hear? <laughs> Bill. <laughs> well, I mean, son of a gun if he isn't. I had you pegged for no more than two pairs. Yeah, Kendall ain't the best player, I see, but he's sure a lucky one. Deal him out, Calamity. All right. No feller once in Hayes City drew two cards to a royal. Luckiest thing I ever seen. That's a local thing for a man to do. Sure was. He took one look at his hand and keeled over plumb dead. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know? No, I had a hand something like that. I won a Chinese girl with it a few weeks ago in Deer Lodge. <laughs> I mean, I did. no kidding. Sure. What did you do with her? Well, I gave her to a man I knew. He married her. Open for a dollar. Ah, uh, wait, 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 wait. Yes, I'm staying. Uh, stay. Mm, me too. I ain't proud. There. Cards? Uh, three. Kendall? Two, please. Mm. Give me one. Now, here's a man's gonna drop dead if he pulls it right. How's about you, Charlie? Uh, two. Dealer takes three. Mm. Honest woman. That's one thing I ain't and I never hope to be. <laughs> Your bet, Wild Bill. Well, I'll tell you, friends, I'm gonna make this rough on you. Two bucks. Mm. All right. I call. Not me. And I ain't dropping dead, neither. Well, I'll see you. I'm a sucker. All right. What do you got, Wild Bill? Prettiest two pair you ever seen. Aces and eights. While Bill Hickok slumped forward on the table, 
He still had the winning smile on his face and the cards crumpled in his tightening fist. It was Calamity Jane who found Jack McCall. He was hiding in a butcher shop nearby. Colorado Charlie and I dragged him away before she had a chance to use the meat cleaver she was holding. We found six cartridges in McCall's gun. The only one to fire was the first, the one that killed Hickok. The other five were defective. Before I left Deadwood, McCall was tried for murder. But Brady and Barnes must have chosen the jury themselves because the final verdict was not guilty. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were John McIntyre, Jeanette Nolan, Jack Moyles, Larry Dobkin, Stacey Harris, and Vic Perrin. Music was composed and conducted by Amerigo Moreno. again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. James Matthews speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network.